Good morning. Welcome to Lapeer Community Church. This morning we are live and uh, Mindy and I and the family just got back from Texas. We are glad to be home. There was a lot of driving. Anyway, um, we're really glad to be home. We were going to do communion this morning. I'm not ready to do that, so I'm just going to postpone communion until next week. So next week, if you, um, and I didn't actually let you know we're supposed to be prepared. So next week, you want to make sure that you have, um, you know, your juice or whatever you want to do for your communion and, and bread and share communion with each other in your own home next week. We'll, we'll share communion next week. Um, we are... Um, going through a series, again, going through the whole Bible of stories, just the stories from beginning to end. I know many of you know that already, but just for those of you who may be new, um, we are in week uh, 13, I believe, or maybe week 12, and we are covering Exodus chapter 32, 33, 34, and 40. Now, last week, um, <clears throat> what we did was we covered the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and and so the people received the Ten Commandments. And then um, what we skipped was the instruction and the building of the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a movable temple. It was a tent and um, fabric on poles that created a courtyard and inside created the place where they did the sacrifices. And the inside, the center tent was where God met with Moses uh, and the Ark of the Covenant was in there where they stored the, the, they will eventually store the Ten Commandments, manna, jar of manna, and Aaron's rod. When we get to those stories, we'll go in the Ark of the Covenant. Um, those things were being made, and those things were, um, they were setting up worship. Now, I didn't have you read all that because it's details about what materials to build, and it's rather um, dull, but it's super important. If And it's not dull if you're actually studying it, but just reading, and what they do is they, they, God tells them how to build it, and then they repeat everything over again as they do everything is, uh, according to instructions. So it's like reading the same thing twice. So we skip that, but what it's really important because it's setting up all of their... Um, religious rites and practices for worship. And um, this is really important. So um, this, this sets up laws for how they're supposed to perform sacrifices and, and, um, and worship God for centuries and centuries and centuries to come. Now they were at um, the mountain here, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, um, worshiping God. They actually, the elders got to see him come down on a, on a thing that was like a pavement that looked like uh, uh, a special stone. And um, and they they worshipped God and but they were at this mountain you know waiting for all of these details about the law and the instructions to build the tabernacle and then building the tabernacle all took about a year and um, they took up a giant offering for all of the. Uh, things necessary for the tabernacles. So they asked for all these materials and people kept bringing material, cloth, wood, jewels, gold, silver, all of this stuff they brought and just willingly gave. And finally Moses had to tell them to stop. We've got plenty. And which is awesome that they were that, that uh, generous with everything that God already gave them because God gave it to them when they came out of Israel, I mean, out of uh, Egypt. And then they just gave it um, for the building of the tabernacle. So now, they, now picture this. They just built the tabernacle. They've seen the smoke on the mountain where God has um, met with Moses. The elders have seen an image of God come down on a pavement made of a special stone, lepis, lazuli, or something like that. I don't remember. But anyway, um, the thing is, uh, they also received the Ten Commandments. And this is super important for what happens next because Moses goes back up into the mountain to receive more of the law and um, he's gone for 40 days and 40 nights and he's fasting and he's alone with God up there and the longer he's gone, the more the Israelites become unsettled. And so they begin to um, complain again and I want to start, so if you'll open up your Bible to chapter 32 of Exodus, go ahead and open up there. And this is where we open up the next scene. Now, this is a really important um, episode in the um, development of Israel because this is where, this is the first time they break one of the Ten Commandments and they break the second commandment. They, they mess up bad. 
So if you open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32, we're going to start reading in chapter 32, verse 1 and through verse 4. All right. So starting in verse 1, when Moses saw, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, let us make gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Now, it's interesting that they've, they've already received the Ten Commandments, all right, which says you should have only one God and worship him only. We'll get into that in a minute. But I can kind of understand Moses being gone for 40 days and 40 nights and, and not knowing whether he's alive or dead. How long do we just sit here and wait? He didn't tell him how, them how long he'd be gone. But the longer he's gone, the more they're like wondering if he's ever coming down. He could be dead. And they're not allowed to approach the mountain. And the cloud of, of God is on that mountain. They're supposed to be killed if they approach the mountain. So they're kind of in a rough spot. They don't know if Moses is there, number one. If he's dead, how long do they wait? But, but it also just shows an extreme lack of, of faith in God. That if Moses has led them this far and God has led them through Moses, that they should be trusting that God will either take care of Moses or lead them on without him. And they're definitely not going to do that. So what they said to, to Aaron is, make come, make us gods who will go before us, which I think is interesting. It's plural. And... Um, as for this Moses, for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. He's disappeared. Now, verse 2, Aaron answered, Take off the gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So remember I told you they made an offering for the tabernacle? Now they're going to make a second offering for an alternative uh, God. So verse 3, they, so that all the people took off their earrings, brought them to Aaron, and he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, what's totally fascinating to me is that um, they, they actually say, these are your gods, plural, that took you out of Egypt, and then... The very next verse, which I don't have here, they they call it Lord. The verse five, he says, "This is the worship of the Lord." They're going to do a festival to the Lord, meaning the calf, and they name the calf and the name. They take the proper name of God Yahweh and apply it to the golden calf. Now, in ancient times, calves and bulls, people uh, in the ancient East Near East, worshipped. Um, them, but they, they didn't believe the image itself was a God. They believed it was either a representation or an image on which God would stand. So the presence of the gods would be on top of a bull or calf as uh, a, a throne, a, a pedestal of power. And if you think about what they had just made in the temple, I know you didn't read this, but in the temple they made the Holy of Holies and in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant. So if you ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what that's supposed to be. And this chest is called the Ark. It's a chest. And it's hollowed on the inside. It's going to have manna, the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod eventually. Now, on top of that, they build two golden angels whose wings touch in the center over and go out. Then you have the angels and the, and the wings go back out towards the walls of the tent. And underneath those wings is supposed to be where God is supposed to be present. And so on top of the pedestal, the chest is where God's supposed to be. Now, Moses is gone. He's up on the mountain and they want to worship a God and they, they create this calf. Now, if you go ahead and remember, if you want to open up your Bible, open up to Exodus chapter 20. So back up, you know, um, 10, 12 chapters or so. And it isn't the first commandment that they broke. It's the second commandment they broke right here, which says in verse four, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything under heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And then it continues for the Lord is your jealous God, etc. So you're not supposed to make anything. They're not supposed to bow down. They're not supposed to worship any of these images. It's an idol that they just made. Now, Here's the thing that we we and to do we look at this and say okay they've they've crossed the Red Sea, they they've they've seen the ten plagues they've seen uh, Egypt brought to its knees the most powerful nation they've ever seen the most powerful nation in the region and they've seen 
God, part the Red Sea, have a pillar of fire lead them at night, a cloud during the day. They've seen God descend on the mountain. They have seen his, him provide water, bread for them every day, even the 40 days that they're out there waiting at the mountain. God is still providing them with miraculous food. And yet, when God tells them, thou shalt not... That's how we, you know, the mm -hmm. ancient way, the, the King James way to phrase all the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are the thou shalt nots. There's also some thou shalt, but the thou shalt nots. This one right here says, thou shalt not make for yourself an image in the form of anything that is in heaven above or earth beneath or in the waters below, and you should not bow down, you should not worship them. That is the command that they just decided to break. And in our minds, looking back, we're like, how could they be so stupid? That's, that's what we, we, we tend to look back on history and look at the mistakes that our forefathers have made and wonder, how could they be so, how could they do that? Even looking at our own history, we can look at some things that we've done as a nation and wonder how the heck did our leaders and our people do these things or get away with these things, whether we're looking at slavery or the Trail of Tears and banishing the Indians. I mean, I've looked at some history, some things I'm just, it's mind boggling to me. Um, some of the things that we have, as Americans have done that we just kind of like ignore. But when we look at them, it's like, how did they do that? You know, how did they just obliterate and slaughter um, Indians, women's and, women and children? The, um, they sign a treaty. We go ahead and give them land in, in, in the Dakotas. And what do we do? We take all that land back and build a monument to our presidents, not theirs, and call it Mount Rushmore and say they should be okay with that. We we gave them that land by treaty and then took it back. I look at it and like how how do we do something like that? How did how did how do we get away with that? How do we get away with so many things? And and you look back and say how could they be so horrible or dumb or whatever and that's our culture i also look back at the bible and we also have to look at the the disciples and and question how do they do these things how could they be so foolish and um what we need to understand is is we don't we don't understand the power that your surrounding culture or the world has on us if you were raised in a culture where everybody worshiped multiple gods and their belief was there are multiple gods, a god of fertility, of god of the sea, of god of the wind, a god of the sun, gods for everything, what happens is there's this one faction that says, no, there's only one god that you're supposed to worship. You're not supposed to worship any others. And they, see, so when they said, we're going to have a festival to the Lord, they still believed in the Lord, but they didn't want to give up the belief in the other gods of the region. And God wanted to protect them from that all along. That's why they weren't supposed to intermarry with the people of the region of, of Canaan. They were supposed to keep themselves separate because he did, they, they were supposed to be um, not influenced by the cultures around them because God knew how tempting it would be, how easy it is to warp the mind and cause them to think right is wrong and wrong is right. <clears throat> and that's the problem, is that they're so used to worshiping. If, if you remember going back, when, when Jacob left his father-in-law's house, he took his wives and his children all with him, and they started leaving, and his wife steals her father's gods. And we're like, what the heck is she doing that for? Well, they believed that they would benefit them and they didn't want to make the gods angry. That It's because everybody around them believed it. Therefore, it's awfully hard not to believe. I remember watching a video one time. You can look this up on YouTube. I think it's a candid camera or maybe it's even a study where they, they did something where they got into a... I think it's actually a candid camera video where they um, put people in a, an elevator and then there's a person that doesn't know they're not they're they're the they're the experimental person. Everybody else is a plant. They're planted there. And all of a sudden, all of them turn around to about face and face the back of the elevator. And the one person who's in there doesn't know what's going on turns around and faces the back of the elevator. And then they turn around and face the front. And he 
follows and faces the front, and they turn around and face the back, and he faces the back. It, we are so influenced by the world around us that we don't even know. We don't know that the absurd thing that we could be doing is wrong. We don't even know. And and I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this, and this is what you need to think about. Maybe you should take a moment in your room right now where if, if you're with somebody else, talk with each other about the things that the Bible says are totally wrong, but we find ways to make them right. The Bible says, thou shalt not, and we say, thou shalt not unless. What things do we do that that God says is not okay that we do anyway. And not only that, if we don't do them, we feel like we're doing something wrong. Just, I'll ask Becca, can you think of anything? Yeah, but nothing I do. Like what? Like people will short themselves and drink and like say at least I'm not an alcoholic, but I can get drunk all the time. Yeah, my daughter said, like, our culture, it's okay to get drunk as long as you don't get blasted and drive, right? Is that basically what no, you're like saying? No, like an alcoholic. So, like, it's oh. okay if I get drunk all the time as long as I'm not an alcoholic. Oh, they'll say it's okay if I get drunk all the time as long as I'm not an alcoholic. That would be something yeah, that... As, as long as I, like, do this stuff with people as long as I'm not sleeping with them. Yeah, I, I can do many things physically with somebody else as long as I'm not sleeping with them. That's another one. Um, or it's okay to sleep with somebody that you're not married to as long as you love them. There, there's a number of things, but I'm going to point to one that um, is so ingrained in our culture that to obey God feels like you're doing something wrong. It feels like you're doing something terribly wrong because our culture has so influenced us that this, the right thing to do is what God said not to do. Are you ready? This is actually really hard for me to do because I'm afraid I'm going to ruffle some feathers. But if you go to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, go ahead and turn there. And we're going to drop all the way down to verse 19, and if you're not reading, I want you to listen carefully, all right? Verse 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin or varmints destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now let's read it this way. Thou shalt not store up treasures for yourself on earth. In our culture, thou shalt have savings that might last as long as you could possibly live. To be able to get you anything that you may need, when you may need it, so that you have enough so that you don't have to worry. To not save up as much as you can is foolish in our culture. In our world, to save up money for yourself is being wise, right? Save up money and capitalize on everything. It's capitalism, right? Capitalism must be godly because if you're not a capitalist, you must be a liberal something or other, you know, a socialist or communist. And, and so we demonize one position and we, we lift up one position as if that is the epitome of what's right. But the Bible's very clear. Now, I'm not going to say anything's wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There are many snares, the Bible says. But the biggest thing is, is that it is very clear, and it's more than once it says this in the Bible. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. All right? Then it goes, verse 20, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it now says, thou shalt invest somehow all the wealth that you do have in heavenly ventures. Not store up for yourself, but to invest whatever you're using your resources for, for heavenly things. In, um, if you're using those things for um, heavenly things now, 
you're actually investing in, in the future that God really wants you to have. And so everything in our culture says, no, you, you take what's left over and then you give away, you, you feed the poor, you take care of people in poor nations or whatever, you do that, but you gotta take care of yourself and your family first. That is just not what the Bible teaches. Yes, it says some things about storing money for a rainy day. The ant, look at the ant, you slugger who slaves up for the winter. But that's not for four. Not for 40 years of a lifetime past retirement. That's not, it isn't excessive. It's, it's enough to, if your refrigerator goes down, you have enough money to buy a refrigerator. Fine. But... To not invest, and this I, I tell you, I struggle with this really bad. Is that is that if I don't put money away to save and invest, if something happens to me, I feel like I'm failing my family, right? I feel like I need to make sure they're going to have what they need, and I don't think that that's a bad desire at all. But figuring out how much do they need is something that we don't spend maybe enough time thinking about. Because I think that we make way more than we need. We save more than we're ever going to need. And, and we don't ever contemplate whether that's wise or not. But the Bible's very clear. Do not, thou shalt not store up treasures on earth for yourself. If you can store up treasures on yourself for others, store it up so that you can give it away or do something with it that's, that's for the kingdom of God, fine. But it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Then, I'm going to skip down a few verses, down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other, you cannot serve both God and money. There you go. There is the golden calf. Gold, gold, right? That, the golden calf is gold. It is, it is wealth. It is having everything that you need so that you don't need to worry, which feels super responsible in our culture, but it is worship of a false God. Because if I have put enough money away... I know that my medical health care and bills will be taken care of. I'll have enough food. I'll have a place to live. I'll have a money to do what I want, travel, fun, whatever I want. It is in money I trust. Even though on the money it says in God we trust, it is not true. It is in our savings for ourselves that we trust. And I got to make sure I have enough before I can give anything else away because I got to protect my God. Now, when Jesus says it is difficult for a rich man to enter through the kingdom of heaven, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. We take that obvious parable that it's impossible to get a camel through the eye of a needle unless you pulverize it into dust and put it through a piece of dust at a time. We, we say there's, we, we, grasp onto a, a camel's gate where the camel had to go lower. And they, this is, if you go through commentaries, it'll tell you that it wasn't really an eye of a needle you sew with. Yes, it was. But we want to find ways around that so that we can find ways to protect our golden calf. And <clears throat> this is just one, folks. This is one of the thou shalt nots that we do that feels if we if we do what God says, we're screwing up so bad. And it's because we don't, we don't trust God at his word and we don't trust, we just don't trust that our culture is wrong. That everybody around us says one thing that we're supposed to do. It's really difficult to hear this still small voice that says, do the opposite. Thou shalt not. And if we obey that, we're going to feel like we are screwing up. We did something wrong. And in truth, we'd be doing exactly what God wants. Now, I'm telling you this. I'm not trying to, to get you to live like me. I, I need to live this way because I struggle. I really struggle. And it's such a warning. 
<clears throat> it's not just about money. It's about the way the world influences the way you think. And that way is going to be in direct opposition to what God teaches. I was only using money as an example. There are many others, many others. And I want you to take time to think about what does the Bible teach that we just don't do because it feels wrong? That, that what does God want us to live like that feels in opposition to what our culture says is right? And we just capitulate to the culture because it feels way more comfortable and it seems like that's right. The Bible can't be right, right? This has got to be wrong. It doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. Well, that means that our wisdom is greater than God's wisdom. That's not something that I would trust in. Yet I do. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 is, is another couple of verses that I committed to memory years ago. I need to recommit it to memory because it's so important. These verses are really significant, all right? Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I want you to listen. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we're supposed to live as a sacrifice, meaning my life is not mine. A sacrifice would have been a lamb that's it's dead. It has no more life. It means I have no life for myself. It is God's life to live through me however he wants. He makes the choices, and there's a reason for this. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That transformation is critical because the world is telling you, do this, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And those are all the op in opposition to what God teaches. Everything the world tells you to do that you shouldn't do, you need to stop. But the thing is, it's really hard if your culture just sweeps you up and you're thinking this is the right thing to do. Everybody says so. They can't, everybody can't be wrong. Well, that's why he says the world. He didn't say, do not conform to the pattern of your friends. Do not conform to the pattern of the whole world that's going one way when I, God, want you to go the opposite way. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That means the way you think, because the way I think is according to the world is going to get things wrong, all right? And I've got to find, i got to spend more time in the scriptures, more time with God, more time in prayer, so that God can renew my mind to overcome the pull the world has on my mind to keep thinking wrong is right and right is wrong. If we don't do this, we're just going to be sucked up in the vortex of the world that's going to keep directing how you should live your life. And it's not supposed to. Christians are supposed to live differently, much differently. And we, should, we live so much like the rest of the world, we don't even know that anything's wrong because it feels like we're just going with the flow, not even questioning whether the things we do are what God really wants us to do. And we need to question them immediately. And I say immediately, not because this time's any more important than yesterday or last week or the week before. It's because you need to start. The sooner we start questioning the things of this world and, and where our heart really is, remember where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Look where you're spending money. Look what you do with your money. That's telling you where your heart is. Open up our eyes, God. Open up our eyes so that we might see what we are making, what you say is wrong, we have just believed is right. And whatever is right, you believe is wrong. Then, it says right here in verse 2, not conform to the pattern of the world, but be renewed by the transform, tra renewing of your mind, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Not before. After you get your mind right, after your mind is transformed, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Remember I said how we look back on the Hebrews that make a false god and wonder how the heck could they do that? Many generations from now, they'll be looking back at you and me and they'll be looking at the things that we do and they're going to be, how could they be so blind? How could they be so foolish? And certainly from heaven's perspective, looking back on our own lives, we're going to look back and say, how could we be so dumb? We miss the obvious. I just point out one. There's other ones. Love your enemies. 
even if they belong to the opposite political party or something. You know, there's so many different things that says love your enemies, not just the, your family. It's very clear. There's so many things in the Bible that says to do that we don't do because it seems absurd. And we just blow by saying we just must not understand it, even though it's black and white. We don't want to. It's easier to conform to the world. <coughs> Please, take the time. Take some time this week to ask God to open up your eyes to see values you have that are contrary to what the scriptures teach. Contrary to God's will, the values that we hold dear, they're going to be these. They're going to be in these camps, okay? You're going to have values that agree with God's will, right? Love your children. Love your wife. Yeah, that's easy to agree with. There are things that are right. There's going to be some things on the other side that are going to say, these are wrong, but they're, I'm pulled in our culture to believe they're okay. There are going to be some things in the middle. They're not bad or good, but we treat them like they're, they're everything God wants, and they just might be just neutral things. They just don't really matter that much, but we make them out to be super important. And you should sort those things out and call them what they are. If they're bad call them as bad. If they're neutral, they're neutral. Other people can do these things or I can do these things or not do these things. It doesn't matter. And then there are some things that God wants us to do and not do and we need to pay attention to those first. Those are the priorities. We need to sort those things out and we need to do that as soon as you can. Don't wait until death's doorstep to get these things right. You'll regret it. You will regret the waste of a lifetime doing things that don't matter. Spending money on things that don't matter. It is extremely important for us to sort these things out. And I'm telling you, I struggle. I really do. I'm, I just really, really struggle with it myself because I feel ashamed if I'm not putting money away. I, I can feel ashamed because of, you know, where we are financially. And why would, where's the source of that shame? It is the world telling me I should have more. I should have more aside. I should have more reserves. I should have better conditioned stuff. All of it's going to fade. All rust, moth and rust destroy. So at what point are we really talking about what God's eternal values are and let them um, openly compete with the world's values and, and, and allow God to renew our minds. With that, I want to pray. I want to take the moment. This is really hard for me because, I mean, I will tell you, the fear of, uh, of uh, a teaching like this is my fear, is that people will take insult to it and they will go somewhere else where someone else will teach um, how important it is to save and, and get lots of money, and then their money goes with them and goes to another church or something. And I, I, I'll tell you, my fears of our church having enough money to do ministry is real. And yet, I'm not supposed to put trust in money. I'm supposed to put trust in God. I struggle. I struggle in trusting in God. I, it's so much easier to trust in God when there's plenty of money in the bank. It just, but, but that just is the light that shows me where my trust really is. It's in the bank, not in the God who owns everything. And so I have work to do. I need to uh, bring myself in a place where I trust him more. And, and I'm not there. And um, so I have a lot of growth, to, I have a lot of growing to do. And, um, and I've been struggling with this for years. I mean, openly struggling. I, it's not like I've just discovered this is a struggle. I struggled and continue to struggle. But it's better than being ignorant or oblivious to the struggle and pretend it doesn't exist because you'll never get your mind renewed if you're not paying attention to the things of the world that pull you away from God. Pay attention. Pay attention. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, Open our eyes to see the things that truly lead us away from you. The things we make excuses for, that down deep we know this is wrong, but we make excuses for it as if it's not going to bother you that much. But just reading the scriptures, it bothers you tremendously. All of the things, the world that pulls us away from you, and we don't even recognize it because it feels 
so right, but it's so wrong. Your word is very clear. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, mm -mm. but the end therein is death. That we could be moving towards death and not ever know it because it seems right. The lessons of the Old Testament, Lord, are there to teach us how screwed up we really are, how foolish we really are. And so, Father, may your spirit just renew our minds, allow us to be more devoted to you, ultimately devoted to you, extremely devoted. You've even forgotten what the word devotion really means. That it is to you our hearts are supposed to belong to. That we expend ourselves and our resources and everything we have is yours. And um, forgive us for how self-centered we are and buying into the world that says we're supposed to be self-centered. That self-centered looks normal to us. And so, Father, I pray that you give us examples of what extreme devotion looks like so that um, self-centeredness doesn't look normal for a Christian anymore. That other people might think we're crazy, but devotion would make all the difference. I pray, Lord, you capture our hearts so that, that um, our love for you would overcome our love for this world that our love for you would be greater than our love for this world. I know for me, I'm not there yet. I love the world far too much. It's tangible. It's easy to see, touch, taste, experience. And it sometimes feels like you're so far and so abstract that it seems easier to trust the things that I can see. But you tell us over and over in the world, in, the, in your word, that the world, the things that we can see are not the things we're supposed to trust, not the things we're supposed to desire. And so, Father, remove these desires from us. Change our minds, change our hearts, that ultimately there could be no question to where our love really lies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Continue um, reading um, your reading mm -hmm. as we go through this. If you uh, just started with us, please just, you can go to lapeercc.org mm -hmm. and you can um, <clears throat> download the reading plan. And um, you can you can also sign up for Q&A. If you have questions about the message today or the passages we just read this week, um, I will be joining you on a Zoom meeting to uh, go through those passages and answer questions. If you want to just go to lapeercc.org, you can then um, uh, sign up for that, and I'd love to see you there. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.